All right. Well, hello everybody. My name is James Pryor. I work in AMD's Austin facility. I'm a part of the client business unit. I'm a channel business development manager, which tells you nothing about what I do every day. And it's kind of different every day as it is. So my background is not as history as Paul Hans. I've only been with AMD for three years this month, in fact. I came to AMD from the journalist side of the fence. The, the little discussion you guys are having earlier brought back all the good memories for me, because I used to write for Range3D.com, reviewing graphics cards, CPUs, that kind of stuff. And I came on board at AMD uh, because I found out about Zen and wanted to be part of that turnaround. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today, but we're primarily focused on our 7th seventh gen APU and some of our desktop stuff. So I'm going to go through a little bit faster than Kohan did. So it won't be too much more of your time. What we've got with our 7th gen uh, processors, is this thing working for you or is it just... Yeah, it's kind of slow. You just, you got to mash it. You have to just, you just push the space bar. Yes. Or it could be your number. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speedy. Oh, Intel inside. Okay. <laughs> Got to get one B in, right? <laughs> so the seventh gen A series APU is coming out in notebooks right now. We announced that earlier in uh, Q1. You saw the first uh, details of, of all those products come out of Computex. This is known as Bristol Rich. And this is a four core APU, so it's got four CPU cores, it has eight GCN compute units, same IP level as Tonga or Hawaii, so it has similar sort of capabilities. And the cool thing about our seventh gen is that we've got two designs there. There's a Stony Ridge, which is a two core, three CPU part, and then there's the Bristol Ridge, which is a four core, eight CPU part. So that gives us a range to go to market with. You only see Stony Ridge in notebooks, they're mostly aimed for entry level PCs and they're in a BGA form. Bristol Ridge is going to come in BGA and in our new AM4 socket as well. And what we are looking to do with this new set of technologies with Stony Ridge and Bristol Ridge was number one is bring that big excavator core to all of our verticals. Before we had the, the CAT class cores, you may have heard of Jaguar, Puma, Catamount, whatever they were at the bottom end. Those have been replaced with excavator all the way down now. And that gives us a little bit more performance as well as more efficiency, surprisingly enough. But what we've done is done some great work around AVFS, which is part of the secret source inside of the Radeon Technologies Group, is really making the most of the thermal headroom, the voltages, and the performance available at any given time. <clears throat> So you also see some updates on uh, the IP side of the fence. You get upgraded UVD and VCE, so for video playback and encode. Now we can do HEVC 8-bit, we can do uh, decode of uh, HEVC obviously uh, with H.264. You've got support for HDMI 2.0 for 4K displays. And we also have uh, DDR4 memory support. And that's something that if you're pretty, if you'd like to deep dive APUs, you'll have seen that previously when you're running anything that's graphics intensive, using those built-in compute units for graphics, then the performance goes up linearly with the memory speed. So at DDR3, we were tapped out at 2400. Now we go to DDR4, we're gonna find there's more bandwidth there. And because we're using that same IP level as Fiji and uh, or excuse me, Hawaii and Tonga, we've got that DCC capability inside the APU as well. So it's gonna give us a nice part for entry-level notebooks and mainstream notebooks that can now actually do some really nice gaming in the esports and online gaming arena. It's not going to be something we're going to say is going to replace a Fnatic PC, but if you're looking for something casual that's portable, that's going to keep you in the game, keep you interested, it's got the performance that matters. So here we've got some great specifications for you to read. I'm not going to bother to read them word for word for you. But one thing I do want to call out is the power consumption improvements. Getting more battery life in notebooks, we're going to get more performance out of lower TDPs on the desktop side. And that's something that's important because when I was on the reviewer side of the fence, I was critical of AMD's power consumption. Right? I'm sure you guys have had a, a few looks at those things as well. But it's one of the things that hopefully we'll get a chance to talk more individually later on today. I want to hear more about what you consider the perceptions are, the problems are that AMD needs to address. Right? Because I want to find out and take that key learning back into our headquarters. That's where I feel my job is, is being a guy that's coming from the outside and coming in. 
So one of those uh, we heard you moments for us was the AMD Wraith Cooler. I know that some of you guys have done uh, some reviews and some testing on this stuff. So our new thermal solution is much quieter than the previous version. It's got a better look and feel to it. We've had some great response around the world from it. We're seeing our sales velocity increase around the products we've attached it to. And it's really helping because when you looked at our, like our point of sale reviews, Amazon, Newegg, similar, then what you see is the people who buy the processors were critical of this heat and noise perception. They didn't, they didn't like that aspect of it. And this guy solved that. And it was a simple thing for us to do. It cost us some money, but we were happy to do it anyway because it was the right thing to do. So we've got a full stack now using these new thermal solutions that go from 65 watts to 125 watts and have some cool LED logos and whatever. Those are all the different parts. Some of those are brand new. Some of those are a bit uh, more of a refresh. Uh, one particular we like to point out is this A107860K. That guy right there, where we took our 95 watt CPU we launched in uh, 2014 and we replaced it with a 65 watt version that was fastest on the CPU side, faster on the GPU side, but with that 30 watt TDP decrease. And then we put a 95 watt thermal solution on it. So you've got out of the box overclocking, headroom, you've got a nice silent solution, you've got a nice low TDP for use in HTPC. And that's one of the more things we want to call out as, hey, we're hearing you, right? We, you've given us the challenges of what's wrong with our product definitions, and we're trying to solve them with the existing technology as well as with our new technology. We also heard there was some room to improve on the motherboard side. We've seen some nice updates this year with some new technologies like USB 3.1 Gen 2, Type A and Type C connectors down on the motherboard. You've got M.2 SATA SSD with NVMe support, so you can use that same SSD that you can put in those high-end notebooks and go straight in the desktop. Then it makes it simpler and easier to upgrade. Multi-core has been uh, a long-term strategy for AMD. If you look at our pricing, then uh, using the US-based uh, SEPs that we do, and I want to hear from you guys more about the Australia tax so I can get a better handle on that uh, as I go back and talk to my headquarter guys about what the challenges are for you. Where we try to go with our multi-core strategy is try to offer one and a half or two times the threads at a price point. So where Intel has four, we've got eight. Where they have two or two with hyper-threading, we've got four, all right, or six. And we want to do that because we believe that multi-threading is the future. And Kohan talked a lot about Mantle. And one of the things that Mantle did natively was introduce this native multi-GPU, but it also introduced native multi-core. So what you can see, you've probably seen this graph in a few of our AMD presentations in a while here, is you can see how the threading breaks out across eight cores, where the game code is primarily on that first core. So that's the programmer taking all of his batches, his code, and putting it into one big code chunk that's just trying to force through one core. But here, the DirectX runtime in red, you can see that that guy is split across all eight cores. So that's the API trying to say, I want to get out of the way of the game code, and go wide. I want to increase my latency response, decrease my latency for responsiveness, and increase my throughput by using more cores. And that doesn't take any effort. We're seeing uplifts in games today, where oh, that's not the slide I thought it was. Okay, so we're seeing uplifts in uh, games today where we can actually do any any developer relations efforts to get there. Hitman's a good one. We did a lot of work there on the GPU. Nothing for the CPU. When you see these games like Ashes or Hitman or others, where you see DirectX 11 performance, DirectX 12 performance, and there's this 40, 50% uplift, that's natural. That's the API doing that. That makes it really easy for the programmer to take advantage of. That means that it's not about our investment. It's about just moving to DirectX 12. You just compile that DX12, you're gonna get the performance uplift. So one of our key messages we've been pushing to our AMD partners is how do we give you more? So here we're talking about FX, talking about specifications. There are a lot of markets where there are people who buy on performance benchmarks. They look at specific titles they're interested in, and there are others where they look at specs. So 
what we're doing is trying to split the difference and show on the specs where we went and show where we went in the performance with DX12 or multi-threaded applications. And as we go into DirectX 12, as Kohan said, there's a lot of titles coming along that are going to use that. They're going to naturally improve the ability to go to use multi-cores. And the interesting thing is they use more power when they do that. The power consumption stays about the same or even drops. And the reason for that is because rather than a single core lighting up its associated cache and its memory controller and trying to run at its highest frequency and just lighting up like a lightning bolt in one tiny little spot that brings all the voltages to its highest states and that keeps the, the power at its highest levels, it moves it across the whole die and it's like tiny little flashes of light instead. And that reduces your overall voltages, it reduces your overall heat, and we all know transistors that run cooler use less power, and that's why you can get more performance out of the same silicon just by switching APIs. And that's an interesting benefit for us because it keeps up, it makes our performance per watt criticism very different. Something that people have said about the bulldozer architecture is, you know, it's got bad performance per watt, where well, you flip a switch and suddenly it's 50% more performance, the power didn't go up, we didn't change the architecture, what happened? So DirectX 12 is very exciting for us. Here you can see how we're gonna be uplifting in different ways. You can see that our six core is gonna go faster than our eight core by switching to DX12, right? And you think of the price difference between those two parts, that's a nice, interesting performance per dollar story, which is probably the most important thing. Right? Here you're getting a lot more performance per dollar just by picking a game that's DX12. VR is another area where we're very interested for our CPUs. Again, that's another place where we want to push for OpenGL Vulkan or DX12 as the API of choice because it naturally allows not only multi-GPU, but multi-CPU core threading. We've got the FX8350 and the 6350 working well as the platform processor, working to show you that the entry point isn't a $350 i7 or more because of the Australia tax. You can come down in price. And we're kind of proud to be the only platform solution provided for VR. We're the only guys you can get the CPU and the GPU from. It was a one-stop shop. And then we find that's quite interesting to a lot of our system integrator partners because it simplifies their support. They don't have two suppliers to worry about. So looking at VR performance, there's not a lot of benchmarks out there right now. We've been using the Steam VR benchmark, looking at which processors and graphics makes the most sense. And the graphics card is by far the most important part of the VR experience. You're not gonna take an R5 graphics or an APU and say, oh yeah, look, VR. That's not gonna happen. So what we look at on the, this for the processor side of the things is, do we have any drop frames? Do we have any CPU bottlenecks being reported? We look at uh, HTC's built-in uh, tool that tells us within a five second period, how many times did we skip a frame? And Valve, HTC, are they working hard to tell developers you know, what is gonna make a good experience? What's gonna give you a good presence? And that's really by, ha by having less than a dozen, less than 10 drop frames in a five second period. That's what breaks the experience for people. There's about 10 or 12. People who are very, very used to VR might be more sensitive to it, but from a general perspective of this is what it is, that's what we're looking at. And what we're finding is that these processes, when paired with these graphics cards, zero. No drop frames, no CPU bottlenecks. They are not the problem with the VR experience, which is excellent news for us. Because again, this is happening without us having to throw a ton of resources and money at CPU engineering to get this performance level. So the next steps, this is my final slide, we can go back to drinking. The next steps is AM4. We saw it at Computex, we saw it at E3, Zen is coming. When you look at our stack today, we've got three different sockets. We have socket AM1, which uses our Kabini SOC. We've got socket FM2+, plus, which has Kaveri, got Avari in it. And then you have socket AM3+, plus, which has Orochi RFX processors in it. And that's a scaling up in performance. Right, if you want entry level, you start at AM1. If you want a little bit more mainstream computer, family PC, maybe something for eSports, as an entry level there, then you're looking at FM2. And if you're going for a performance gamer, you're looking at FX. But the feedback is obvious and clear. 
it's expensive to upgrade because you have to change two components, motherboard and processor when you want to go. You can't do the piecemeal. And with the average refresh period now being three to four years on a full PC, people are doing more and more component upgrades. So with AM4, we're going to stop that. We're going to go to a single socket that goes top to bottom. That's DDR4, it's PCIe Gen 3, so all the latest technologies on there. And Bristol Ridge and Summit Ridge, the Zen CPU, will both fit in that same socket. So there won't be the same problem you have today where you'll have one set of motherboards for the high end and one set of motherboards for the low end. You'll be able to grow up and down the stack, however you want to do that. That's it. Any questions? Yes? Why didn't we see any AM4 boards at Computex? We didn't see any AM4 boards at Computex because we don't want to show them. We have a competitor who had a lot of them. And I am not going to show them my hand <laughs> until the very last second. We are all in, but we are not going to start bluffing. Yes? Um, you showed off, I think you showed Summit Ridge. Yep, Summit Ridge. Um, with them, but that was running Vulcan and in the last couple of presentations we heard actually very little about what that's been DirectX 12 or DirectX 12. How are you finding support for Vulcan among developers? Support for Vulcan is uh, similar to what it is today with OpenGL. There's a few surprising pockets of people who are like, yeah, well, I want to use Vulkan. Um, it's mainly more on the business side of things, like Autodesk are very interested in Vulkan, whereas the game developers are looking more for the portability between the different platforms, AMD power consoles, AMD power PCs, really easy to move backwards and forwards across those two things. Going, but Vulkan lets you go in the mobile, right? So it depends on the developer. If there's someone who's thinking about a game that's gonna go from a tablet to a PC to a console, they wanna use Vulkan, they're interested. If you're thinking about someone who's just about AAA gaming, like an EA Dice, right? Then they're DX12 because they're already trained on DX12, they know how to use it really well, they've got their ninja programmers already you know, doing the high-end, super cool things, and they wanna stay with that. So that's how I'm seeing the, the differences there. One big exception there is Steam, because uh, they have their own OS on Linux, and they want something that's cross-platform. Steam is very, very uh, leaning very heavily into Vulkan, and you'll, so you'll see, you know, because they want to support Mac OS, Windows, Steam OS, um, you'll see them pushing developers more and more to the Vulkan as well. Very true. For the store access. Yeah. Yes. Um, why uh, in the VR performance slide was the R X four eighty not mentioned? because I'm a little bit lazy and I didn't update it with the full <laughs> stuff. Um, honestly, it's because uh, I have a legal process I have to work through. They take about a week to go through stuff and it was just in the US, 4th of July week, and there weren't that many people around the legal department to get me new refresh notes. Because of the freedom. Of the freedom. <laughs> right? So there was an eagle, he distracted me. I don't know what. I, Beef ribs, I ate too many. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, like, do you actually have numbers to say where it fits on that kind of scale? Yeah, it's really similar to 390. We're not seeing any huge differences in experience there. And, you know, as uh, the product gets more and more uh, field tested, you're going to see more and more performance come out of it. I think it's, it's going to end up being a really nice uh, VR card. I'm excited about it. But somebody else have any questions? All right. And a drink. So yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Gohan, James, um, for your update, and thanks. For your, thank you all for coming. Uh, please stay for a while, have a have a beer and uh, a bite to eat, and uh, try out some of the demos that we've set up for you. So thanks for coming. Thanks, guys.